Hello, hello. How you guys doing? Let me see here. You know what? I've been in such a rush to get this podium stuff out. I forgot to put on my traditional hat. <clears throat> Sound check. Man, that chat's going so fast. Audio's great. Thank you. Okay, for those, you know, as we slowly warm up into the video, this is going to be a deep one. I promise you, you're going to hear a lot of new stuff. Archaics veterans, you're going to have some aha moments. Christians that are new to my channel, you're going to see a whole new aspect of New Testament teachings, a whole new way to wrap around what Jesus was conveying to us. This isn't a Bible study. But it, but it does require us to look at five or six passages to get a better understanding of what was being conveyed as opposed to what we are taught by the church. So, uh, the, uh, the thumbnail and the title is not deceitful. We're going to get into time travel because it's all relative here. Now, those of you, uh, as we wait for more people to come in the door, uh, let me get these announcements out of the way. First, in the Archaics Community post, you will see I provided the link for the Patriot Pacification Program PDF. The reason it wasn't immediate, immediately released is because the poll was taken from Facebook, YouTube, Archaics TV, and uh, Twitter. But I used my fifth filter. My fifth filter was the video itself. The feedback I got, I read all the comments. I got emails from people that were concerned about people who had been added to the list and those who weren't on the list. Uh, I wanted it to be as thorough as possible. Now, there was many people who wanted others to be added to the list, but I didn't do it because I stuck with those who were voted on. It doesn't mean this is all of them. But there were two names that had to be put back on the list because of the overwhelming amount of responses and emails I had that I had taken them off of the list prematurely. So, uh, you guys, this is why the list was delayed, and now and now it's done, and it's a free PDF download. Go to the Archaics community or go to the actual video in the description box of the actual video and download that link. Uh, you can do that now, or you can wait till after this video. If you wait till after this video, that's cool too, because you'll have a second download to get for free. Because this video is so important that it's it's already been PDF'd, and it already has a cover image, and I'm going to upload it to Podio, Podio as soon as this video is over, because you're going to want these show notes. You're going you're gonna to want to be able to read what we're discussing today. All right. Now... So you have two free PDFs to download today. Mm. Man, you know what? Get this, get this show started. I don't want to run out. All right. So, Houston meetup, March 30th. We're already selling tickets, and we can only sell so many. So right now is a real good time to get them. Secure your spot. The venue, many of you have been in the venue. We've already been there three times. Many of you have been there. The last time we did the circle, everybody got in a big circle together. It was awesome. We did free raffles of archaic stuff. Martaliki's going to be there with us again this time. So uh, uh, the link, that link too has been distributed widely. Let me get in here real quick. I forgot to put my announcements on this on this laptop so i had to bring this one all right here they are so the houston meetup you can get that you can get the uh the link almost anywhere now so, uh, several people have i know my moderators have posted it in the in the chat 777 people nice i figure i figure i'd draw a bigger a bigger crowd with the uh time travel deal well, that's okay we're going to get into it. It's their loss. Hi, Tiger Turtle. Mm. 
All right. So, uh, <clears throat> the Florida meetup is going to be next. March 30th is the Houston meetup. I mean, if you're in other states and you want to come, you're more than welcome. Contact Don. She can even tell you some good lodging, good places to stay in, in, in the Houston area or uh, in the surrounding parts. But the Florida meetup is soon after that. It's in April, the very next month, April 20th. Uh, April 20th, they're about somewhere. We're just right now just trying to find the right venue. So that's the Florida meetup. All right. <clears throat> Raffle, we're giving away a lot of stuff, not just merchandise, but, but books from the 1800s, nonfiction and fiction. Um, I have a lot of extra copies of stuff. So the raffle is this weekend. We're doing raffles right here. It's not one single, we got a raffle rotisserie. It's not just one single one. We're going to be doing multiple raffles because we're going to be sending multiple packages out. Remember, I'm also trying to clear space, guys. So I'm not one or two or three or four is not going to be enough. I need to do several raffles. There'll be a lot of winners and we'll be sending this. That's not the first time we're going to do this, but this this weekend. We're going to do that live on YouTube and, and do a, a video presentation. So where are my... Oh, check this out. So, you guys know, this is a uh, Billy Carson and Matt LaCroix's book. You are, you guys already know. I'm not going to beat them up in this video. You guys already know. There's no bibliography, but the book, uh, in my personal opinion, is absolute garbage. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to do a, a critique on it. But because, because so many of these New Ager guys that just don't know anything about Sumerian and Akkadian history, that copy everything Zechariah Sitchin said, they really just don't know. They're, they have new heroes. They have new heroes that they're following. Uh, Cliff High fell into this trap. And while I respect Cliff High on, on, on many levels, when it comes to chronology and history, I do not. And uh, he's not the only one. They are too. So this is this is a this is a up up and rising hero to a lot of those in the Anunnaki ancient aliens paradigm. This guy here, the Naked Bible, let me tell you something. There's no bibliography in this book either. I've been flipping through this book, absolutely astounded that people in this day and age fall for this crap. So he's going to get the business too. I'm going to do a YouTube video on the Naked Bible, trying to show that the Bible shows ancient aliens and all that. Well, been, I'm, I'm about to reach out and touch old Mario Biglino too. He is he is absolutely a writer of the Vatican. And uh, we're going to address that. Yeah. That book's going to end up on a back shelf somewhere. I keep timing out on my on my announcements here. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> my hammer. For those of you who don't know, it's Mjolnir. Yeah, for those on the outside looking in, you're always going to call it Thor's hammer and all that. This is Mjolnir. This is the hammer of Thor. Has a name and identity. It is Mjolnir. The hammer was divine, and it gave Thor the ability to equally punish his enemies and bestow blessings upon upon the meek, upon the people. This is this is this is what Molnir stands for. All right, I know I got some Vikings in the chat. They know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Thor's hammer was a. Thor's hammer was an identity, and it allowed him, it allowed him to, to do great things for the people, restore order, pass out blessings, heal, heal, open up people's eyes so they could see. And at the same time, it allowed him to crush his enemies with absolute perfection. All right. Houston meetup, Florida meetup, raffle. Uh, let's see, the Billy and Matt book. Okay, Naked Bible. I got that. This weekend doing a fantastic collaboration with Chris and Steve Krimi. Uh I was at I was at their house. I was at their house uh last year. I really like them. We're going to we're going to visit them again, but we're going to be talking about the most ancient ancient land that I have been able to come across. Don't get offended if you live somewhere else. Watch the video and understand why why I say this. But this is the land of Catalhoyuk. This is the land of Gobekli Tepe. This is the land of the 61 underground cities that have been found in from ancient Anatolia. This is a pre-Hittite 
civilization. This is the land where Ararat is. This is the land of the nativity of many ancient authors who claimed that there is a structure, an ark, on the slopes of this mountain. I have many books right here about Noah's Ark and what has been discovered, what has been found, about Russian the Russian reports. Uh, it's amazing, guys. Even about the flyby that President Carter did in Air Force One to, to fly over it and see it. Yeah, guys, I got all this information. We're going to be talking about this area because there's nothing, there's no other area in the world where we have so much archaeology underground, 61 ancient cities. And then on the surface of the ground, underneath, totally buried in mud, are about 60 more surface sites called tepes. Gobekli Tepe is only one. It's only one. I have a special shirt for that presentation, too. You're going to like it. Somebody sent it to me in the mail. Because I can't pronounce that damn word. So we're gonna uh we're gonna be talking to Chris and Steve Krimi because they've been there. They searched the site. They've been to India, they've been all over Turkey, the Mediterranean, they live here in the United States now. They're very well known in, in the alternative history community. They're also very well known in uh, I guess I, I guess I would call it metaphysical education, mystic circles. Uh, they have a lot of friends and in, in, uh, throughout the community. So uh, we're going to be talking to them this weekend. Now, message from someone in chat. All right. Okay, so so Mario, somebody sent me a message through Dawn that this guy here pulls from the Leningrad Codex. Well, I have to look at that. I'll have to look at that, but it doesn't matter to me. If you don't provide a bibliography, nobody can take you seriously. There's no bibliography in this book. So I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to look into it. I'm going to look into it, guys. Yeah, but Cliff High was citing that guy like it was just all 100% factual. That's why I did that Cliff. That's why I did that video, not even knowing that Cliff High's opinions all came from this guy. So that's it. To, in the interest of all fairness, now I have to investigate this book. And show you guys, show you guys what I find. So, last last announcement, guys. Remember, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Instagram, but there is a Jason Brashears who is pretending to be me on Insta. He's been doing it on Instagram for a while. He's got thousands of followers. Oh, uh, he's the same guy on Facebook doing the same thing. He's using the same picture. Now, oh. Uh, He's got some gall. Believe me, he doesn't want to meet me in person. He's got some gall. He's already reached out on Facebook since I've been deleted and started messaging Don. Now, just remember the Jason M. Brashears on Facebook is not me. That's that dude's a that dude's a scammer. He's already tried to scam many people. Also, though he's the same person with, with the Jason Brashears archaics account on Instagram. I'm not in on Instagram. So just remember, guys, don't get scammed. And anytime you just blocking, reporting, do whatever you want, but it's not me. It's not me. Instagram and Facebook, that's not me. All right. So, okay, I'm done with that. Now, man, I got a buddy that I went to New Mexico with. He traveled with us. I don't know if he wants to be named, so I'm not going to name him right now. But but uh, he knows that I've told you guys in prior presentations that if you want to have a really good mental picture of what a total 100% systemic infrastructure collapse would be like, then you need to read a book in the series called Out of the Ashes by William Johnstone. Now, I don't recommend this book for the, I don't re recommend this series for the light of heart. I don't recommend I don't I don't recommend this series for anybody who who can't objectively process data without getting too emotionally involved because that's a problem. Yeah, you you don't need to read that series then. But this is a very accurate picture of what how of how bad things get very fast as soon as all the bad people in your community realize law enforcement's not coming. Yeah, so this is a, it's, it's amazing guys. How, uh, cults and everything. Anyway, I, I had, 
And when I was in prison, I told you guys the story. When I was in prison, I read, my dad sent me the whole series of books that he could find. He couldn't find anything available after book 24. I got, I read books one through 24. So then I met Eric at the book tree in San Diego. And Eric, you guys know Eric. You guys have seen Eric. He had the big old monster van. Huge. He came to the, the Archaics meetup as security. A uh, really good guy. He's donated a bunch of books. I I need to reach out and talk to him again. Matter of fact, but uh, he's uh he sent me the entire series and the books after that book 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 that I had not read. I was amazed. I'm like man, thank you. I got them all in my library in, in my other studio library. So I don't have them in this library. Well, he didn't even know that there was still two more books. The final in the entire series, Escape from the Ashes, which was released after William Johnstone died. And my buddy just sent this to me with a book that was written right when William Stone, was published right when William Johnstone died. It is a spin-off. It's another series that spins off the Out of the Ashes, but it starts book one of another series, but he died. So it's never series isn't going to get finished. But I have them in my collection now. And I just wanted I just wanted to show some appreciation. And before I, I begin this epic presentation, I have to show off my publisher just sent me this book. It's called The History of America, Narrative and Critical History of America. It's in fine print. It has hundreds of maps and illustrations. It goes back to the very early, I'm talking about ancient writers, ancient, we're talking about the ancient, ancient Greeks, Romans, Phoenicians, Libyans, everything about what has been said about colonizing and exploring the Americas all the way from ancient times. It is in micro print. 1889. A beautiful book. A beautiful book. What I love about it is it's got more, it's got just as much bibliography than it does actual fa uh, a facial text. Oh, that's bibliography where my thumb is, showing all the source materials for just that little bit at the top. But it's a, it's a huge book. It's old. And I'm definitely going to get into it with my, I have another book that somebody's been asking me about, but I need to do the video before I produce. I release it. I have another book from 1824 about the Aboriginal history of Kentucky. So I, I got some really interesting books about ancient America. I need to get in. I need to get into them. Just wanted to share those. They sent me a Phoenix card. I appreciate that, Michael and Shalona. But they had given this to my publisher, to my publisher book tree. They had given it to Paul Tice in San Diego and asked him to mail it to me. So I appreciate that. You guys know, any old book sent to me is going to be shared with the community eventually. I do have another announcement. Big John finished the entire Archaics Library PDF catalog. Every title, every author, date of publication and publisher of everything you see here and the books that are boxed up. He finished it. Dawn edited the list, made it, cleaned it up, made it look real nice and all that, and it's already in the UK. Danny of removing the shackles is already finding all the PDFs that are available free online. And she's downloading them and collecting them and putting them aside. So when we find out which PDFs are not available to the public, those PD, oh, oh, uh, many of my books have never been PDF before. Very rare. I have some, I have some editions in here that I have like the 30th copy of an edition of only 100 copies that was ever released. Like the history of India. Yeah, $1,227 book. So I showed that right here on YouTube. I have books that have never been PDF. Google has no copies of them. We're going to PDF them ourselves when Danny gets back to us about how many PDFs she's missing. Once we have the entire Archaics Library PDF, it's going to be freely available to you guys. We already have the, have the new website laid out how we want it, but it's going to be you know, a website where free, you can go in there and read all these books, or you can download them to your own devices in case anything ever happens to archaics, anything ever happens to infrastructure, anything like that. But uh, yeah, it's amazing guys, because I'm never in my lifetime ever going to be able to do discourses on every book that I possess. So this, may, this makes it me comfortable that the community already has access to the data, whether I, I, I've, I've discoursed about it or not. Ah, 
Let's see here. All right. That's all my announcements. We got plenty of people to start this start this presentation. Let me remove that from the stage. This video is going to go a whole lot more fluid because I don't have any anything anything to show. I don't have anything to show, so there, you're just not going to have any problems waiting on me to to do all these things. So the subject matter is time travel, but in order to get to that, we have to clear we have to clear the board of some other things that we have discussed in archaics. We have new members here. We have archaics veterans that have gotten so lost in newer materials they have forgotten first principles. It's very, it's very easy to do. This is why I like to do these personal resets. I like I like to get out of the the in just a lot of the entanglements, especially the real deep chronological material, like I'm like we're about to get back into. Amazing patterns, new stuff I'm going to show you guys. But before we can't just do that gung-ho all the time and it can't always just uh cr be critical of of bad data as well sometimes we have to do these personal resets sometimes i, I gotta kick back and i have to stop what i'm doing and i have to li listen to spirit sometimes I i'm literally forced to just go into modes of inactivity and then when i'm doing that my mind goes to like fiction and I, I want to go in, okay, well, let me work on my Oracle Chronicles, my Phalorn Saga. Let me put some of these videos out like I did last week uh, on the uh, Gririk and the Witch of Dimwood. So uh, sometimes spirit just puts a halt to things. And and within within a day, it normally takes me one day, I just have this a massive, massive message to, to get out to you guys. And it only happens when I just, I just listen to that inner voice. The inner voice just tells me, hey, man, quit. Quit doing what you're doing. Stop. Close your laptop. Go go do some errands, you know. And I'll go to Home Depot and I do do. Jr. and I will build something. Next thing I know, you get a presentation like this. This is what happens. This is what happens when you just stop and let spirit flow, and quit trying to intellectualize everything. So we're about to get into this now. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Speaking of letting go and letting spirit, a lot of you have been pressing me for the the Olympic decode of the uh, the ceremonies and all that. And I've been putting it on a back burner because I haven't been felt led to do that. And then suddenly, I know Don Don's in, I know Don's in the chat. She can tell you all about it. And then suddenly. I wasn't even, it wasn't even on my mind. I was driving and I told Dawn about it when I came back. I was driving and, uh, cause I go back and forth between her property and my property all the time. And I was driving and it just overcame me. I was on the road and I, I don't want to call it a download or nothing. I just, it just, all of a sudden I realized something major that I had been missing. I told you guys the elite are operating by the Greek Olympiad calendar. But it's not the only one. And I'm so glad I, I held back because I had to go back into my chronicle and pull everything out about the Olympiad calendar in about a very specific date, 583 BC and what happened. Thales of Miletus, a Phoenician by remote descent, he had predicted the darkening of the sun. Sorry, guys. I ain't shaved. I'm itching. He had predicted the darkening of the sun, and it happened exactly as predicted, and it happened in the month of May. And I have a lot of information about that year and about that date. But what I had totally forgotten was in the middle of an Olympiad, this occurred. And it started a whole new calendar that was also based off four and eight year increments. And yet, because of this event, the Oracle of Delphi, it created a whole new calendar called the Pythian calendar, the snake calendar. And it too is, is, is in four year increments. And it opened up my mind to two statements in the book of Revelation that blew my mind. Absolute, perfect calendrical references to this calendar. I couldn't believe it. 
now that I've seen it, I can't unsee it. it. Has everything to do with how the seals are being are being undone. It has everything to do with Apollo Pharmacia. So you you'll be getting that soon because that's that's a uh, that's how that's how it works, guys. Uh, the elite, the elite don't didn't care about us discovering about the Olympian calendar because that was just the civil calendar. The real one we need to watch out for is the Pythian calendar, and it denotes something totally different. It's amazing. We're going to get into that. Uh, and, and, and it was only because I just let go and just let spirit tell me when it's time to do it. And that's what happened. I got I got this amazing information. So we'll get into that. That's another that's a subject for another video. But for right now, we're I need to remind you guys, you know, a few things about uh um things we've learned in the past in archaics that we can't overlook, such as you know, we've done many discussions on thought is thought is energy and thinking creates more energy. We've talked about this ad infinitum. And energy is always seeking new forms of expression. All right? Those who are subject to dungeon programming can't see this. They can't see beyond the perimeters of, of the phenomena that confine them and make their life repetitive. They can't see these things. They, they, see, they view people like me espousing the ideas that I espouse to be absolutely out of, my, out of our minds. I don't care. They call me shill. They call they call they call me fake guru. I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn. I I don't compared to the amount of content I put out. I don't really go into this type of phenomena. This basically creating our own reality type phenomena as much as as others do. It's pro it probably it's probably ten percent of my of my content, but it's enough. So I've also I've also mentioned many times that everything that we would ever want in life it already exists. It already exists as a form somewhere. The only distance is is I mean the only the only difference is there's a huge di distance between that phenomena and you experiencing it. So the key is is how do you close the distance between uh, between what you want to experience and what you are presently experiencing. Experience, I'm, I, I'm accentuating experience because that's what this is. Remember, this isn't an actual reality. It's a perceived reality. And when you start, when you start assessing data from that perspective, that, wow, every, I'm, ob, I'm an objective, personal informed field and everything is an experience not an actuality it gives you great power to begin modifying those experiences if nothing is really actual if nothing is really physical then that means it can be changed a whole lot easier than if it was concrete if it, if it was something that was definite which it is not. Remember, we live in a realm that everything that we experience is just different modes of spirit vibrating at different frequencies that give us this per this perceived reality, not an actual one at all. So because it is thought and belief that we have, uh, you know, it's thought and belief that have kept us at the place we are in life right now. Therefore, it must be thought and belief that gets us out of the situation that we're in right now. And you're going to understand by the end of this video how time travel applies to this scenario. So, remember... I am more than I suppose myself to be, which means I am more than anything that can happen to me. You need to adopt that. I'm going I'm to repeat it. I am more than, than I suppose myself to be. Therefore, 
I am more than anything that can happen to me. You need to, you need to apply this principle in your life. You need to understand it. You need, you need to remember it on a daily basis. And I promise you, the effect is going to be phenomenal in your life, even to the point where people who think they've been very, very close to you are going to realize there is a huge, vast gulf between who they thought you are and who you really are. They're going to perceive it. Can't hide it. Okay, uh, now, in the 11th century, we're talking about a thousand years ago, 900 years ago or so, Meister Eckhart said, I receive that God and I are one. I am then an immovable cause that moves all things. He could have never said that without first understanding that he's in a perceivable reality, not a, not a actual reality. He would have never been able to make, to make this amazing spiritual statement. Another thing, another thing in archaics that this isn't single to archaics. Many, many people have, have know these things already. They're in published books. They're in some of its law of attraction. Some of it's Rhonda Byrne. Some of it's who are just different people, but the thought of power produces power. If that's true, then we must be in a perceivable, a perceived reality and not an actual one. If thought alone of being powerful thus creates the power that is imagined, then this realm is very different than we're taught it is. Another, another teaching in our another teaching in our case, one that I have brought to the table. Very important because dungeon programming requires it. You need to break pattern. Breaking pattern is what any soul can do to get the constructs immediate undivided attention. Yeah. The construct isn't focused on one of a hundred million people all believing and doing the same thing day for day. It's not. Dungeon programming protocols are set in place to maintain that continuum. It takes very little energy. Those programs and routines are already there. But one of those hundred million suddenly, inexplicably, does something different, totally breaks pattern. You have the undivided attention of the construct right then and there. Breaking pattern is necessary. One, to divorce yourself from the collective. And two, you are putting yourself on center stage to all the anticipatory builder, builder protocols. They're waiting. This is something new, and they're just watching. Remember, this is a neutral field. The simulacrum, the simulacrum is neutral field. It is the construct. The construct is not good or evil. Don't confuse it with the agitator program AIX. Artificial Intelligence X is the agitator. Don't confuse it with AIX. The neutral field of the construct is going, I'm going to show you examples in this, in this uh, presentation, but it does for you things already. I'm going to show you in this video that your life today is already the result of you experiencing and executing this power. You have already used the builder protocols numerous times in your life. So if you have used them subject to negative default programming, subject to dungeon programming, you let the world put definitions on your existence. Believing in that grammar has allowed you to use the builder protocols to put the perimeters and confines and the negativity in your life that you're experiencing. It's that easy. And since it was so easy that you didn't even know that you were doing it, you're able to undo it just as easily. Because remember, an awareness of power creates power, but being aware of a phenomenon gives you power over that phenomenon. So this is what we're going to talk about. That's my intro from, from off the jump. We're about, we're about to go deep. Let me check my, my chat, make sure everything's going right. 
That was just my intro, guys. We're about to start this presentation. Hello, One Tux. Shiva Shampoo. Spinning Pyramid. That's a new name to me. Maurice, how you doing, brother? Pamela Swan. I think Shiva Shampoo and pa Pamela Swan are probably the most ubiquitous YouTubers out there. They're everywhere. I can just pick a YouTube channel, go out there, and I'm going to find one of them on it. All right. Let's see. All right. Chat, chat's looking good. Man, we're gonna get into time travel. We're gonna come, we're going to get to it from a way you would have never anticipated. Guys, you guys know I have dark scriptures playlist. I am a critic of the old testament and new testament as it is presented to us. But from the beginning of my published books, from the beginning of my YouTube channel, I have always asserted that there are divine truths that have been buried and hidden, gems, Easter eggs that are put all throughout these texts. Remember, from the beginning, I've been telling you the Bible is a book of good and evil. A book is nothing but a processed tree, a tree that is filled with knowledge. That's what a book is. From the very beginning, before Adam and Eve, in the story of Adam and Eve ever sinned, evil was already existing in the construct, in the form of a tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Bible is a book of good and evil. It is the story of two realities. One of them is the oversoul, which instructs us, teaches us, guides us, and empowers us through imagination, intuition, and empathy. And those stories are allegories. They are metaphors. They are parables. Because these are images of truth. And because... The true eternal could never be accurately represented in a false construct. It has to communicate to us in these indirect ways. Inside the construct, AIX does everything it can to carnalize all philosophies, all spiritual teachings, all belief systems, to get you to believe that certain historical narratives are either true or untrue, to put physical bodies on what were originally spiritual constructs. This is what the Agitator program is designed to do. So my Dark Scriptures playlist is designed to show you fact from fiction. The spiritual teachings are real. That these people never really lived in, in history is a whole nother matter. Now, we're going to get into some amazing stuff. We're going to approach the topic of time travel and how it can benefit us right now. As soon as this video is over, time travel can benefit you easily. And I encourage you to download this don't just, don't just listen to the video, read the PDF, the download, which will be available as soon as this is done. So we have to, we have to process something that is very deep. Sh screw the seminaries. Don't even, seminary, seminaries are churning out nothing but devils now. You already know the televangelists, they're all demonic. Uh, nothing. These, they don't, they wouldn't know Jesus's message if they met Jesus in person. So we need to discuss what the teacher actually conveyed. What was Jesus' core message? Why we was here? It's going to surprise you. Now, so <clears throat> I know a lot of Christians are already probably answering, oh, I know what Jesus said. Jesus told us to forgive others. And Jesus told us to do unto others. Okay, cool. You got all the golden rules down pat. Excellent. Excellent. So if he was a real person, if he was truly the son of God, if he was the sum of many ancient figures and faiths, if he was crucified or if he wasn't, if he lived to an old age, if he never existed at all and he was just a part of a Greek stage play, none of these matter compared to his message. Remember, guys, since when is a man more important than his message? The message lives on far after the man is gone. 
And this would have been known by any great orator in the past. Any great teacher in the past would have always known that their teaching would always outlive the mouth that spoke it. So, with Jesus, we have a spiritual law laid out for us that almost the entire world has missed. I'm not saying I'm the only one that found it. I'm just saying that almost the entire world has missed it. Because had they have truly un understood what I'm about to convey to you, the world would have unfolded totally differently. The history of the world wouldn't be wouldn't be bloodshed and 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 churches instigating wars and different religious wars and conflicts and all. It would have been totally different. But it was missed because it wasn't for the many. Jesus was not here to save the construct. We're about to get to that now. So Jesus said over and over and over, go and sin no more. This is what he said. So this was all the guilty had to do. Remember, they brought the woman in, caught in adultery, but they didn't bring the man. Remember, Jesus was writing the names of the Pharisees in the sand because the wicked, the wicked, the, the wicked are written in the earth, and they saw their names. The Pharisees saw their names in the sand. That's why. That's why they all were convicted. It wasn't just because he said, "He who is without stone, let him cast." I mean, he he who is without sin, let him cast. I drank too much coffee this morning, guys. It's like my fourth cup. Let me slow down. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So, but it also, the scripture says that he he bent down and wrote in the sand with his finger. Yeah, well, you know what? That's all. That's pretty interesting because we find in the Old Testament when that happened, the wicked were being written in the earth. And we also find when the finger of God appeared on the wall in King Nebuchadnezzar's palace, it was the prophet Daniel that, that, that saw it and interpreted it. And well, Nebuchadnezzar saw it too. He interpreted it as mean, mean, tickle a parson, meaning weighed, weighed, numbered, and divided. Your kingdom has been found wanting and will be divided between the Medes and the Persians. That was the, that was the prophetic interpretation. It's still a, a message of judgment, just like writing the names of the Pharisees. So, but to Jesus, the woman in adultery, who, who cares that she laid with 400 different men in a 12 year period and she was making her life. Jesus didn't care about no, he didn't ask her for no details, didn't none of that. All Jesus cared was go and sin no more. That was it. And it wasn't the only person he said that to. So there were times when people had, had problems that were beyond the moral and the ethical and and jesus's response was the same no matter what the problem was go and sin no more so the past was irrelevant to jesus pay attention this is a video about about time travel the past was irrelevant to jesus the core teaching of jesus was that the selfless act of an instant can undo a lifetime of guilt. You need to process that because this is how, this is how Jesus treated everybody. He treated everybody. Didn't care how many, how many trespasses and for how long it had been going on. Not once did Jesus ask for a personal detail from anybody concerning their wickedness, their past, or none of that. If you hear any, it's because they offered it. He never, he never required it. His message, go and sin no more, is literally screaming to you that the selfless act of an instant can undo a lifetime of guilt. This relates to timelessness. Remember, God is eternal. So, if this is true, that the past does not obtain, that the past does not restrict the soul acting in the present, then it must be equally true that the soul acting in the present can reap the benefits from its future self. If within the coordinates of our sojourn through this experience, 
you know, we're powerful, having grown more powerful with the accretion of, of newer experiences and lessons and experience, then there's no barrier between the future you, the future you, and who you are today. There's no difference. Remember, time does not obtain in the world of the spirit. So any limitations that you experience today are entirely self-imposed. Remember, if you believe resistance to anything will be experienced, then the construct will, will conjure all kinds of phenomena that will provide you the resistance that is expected. Jesus didn't call for it. He said, go and sin no more. That's absolute. So, uh, let's see here. Yeah, Jesus is a huge enigma. Huge enigma. So, I'm going to remind you, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, 13. Let me read this to you. Hebrews 11, 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Strangers and pilgrims on the earth is implicit that they knew they were not here to save it. Let's go through that real quick. Talking about the patriarchs of the Old Testament, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off the future. In their present, they saw the future, accepted it as real, and were very comfortable when they died with that knowledge. This is what's being conveyed here. And they, it says, and they embraced it. And they confessed in the past, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay, guys, they weren't here. There, there, is, there is nowhere here that you find that the holy, the elect, the redeemed, the saved are here to save the world. 1 Peter 2.11 in 1 Peter 2.11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. This admonition recognizes believers as temporary residents on earth, urging them to live holy lives in anticipation of somewhere better. Can't get more direct than that than this passage in Peter. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.1. Paul speaks of the earthly body as a temporary dwelling, saying, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Where have you heard building of God before? Remember my video on the Christian mysteries? The elect, each, each immortal soul is a white stone in the monument of man, which is the building of God. When in the last days, that monument is complete, meaning the number of the souls is shut off. That will be making exodus. The rest of the collective are going to be here for the reboot, and they're going right back to the beginning, Genesis. So, a building of God is another reference to the Great Pyramid and the coming of the chief cornerstone. So Hebrews 13, 14, for here we have no continuing city, but seek one to come. What? So we're the elect, and according to our holy scriptures, we're waiting on a city that's not here yet, but we're waiting for it to come. We know this is attached to the idea of the return of the chief cornerstone, which is only a small part of a much greater structure. 
this is interesting because it reinforces the concept of us being sojourners on earth. Hebrews 11.10 reads that Abraham, he looked for a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. There's only one trip in the Old Testament that Abraham took. There's only one. He went to Egypt. We already know what's located in Egypt. So, Yeah, I didn't know if I wanted to wear my prodigal son. We're going to be talking about the prodigal son. I didn't know if I wanted to wear my prodigal son shirt or if I wanted my just passing through shirt. Both of them, both of them are good. All right. Now, we only have five more verses to go through. Then we get deeper, well, six more verses. We can get deeper into this presentation. But you got you got to know this because this is these are the words of Jesus. Every single one of these passages I'm about to do. John chapter 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from here. You're not supposed to, to you're not here to save the world, my friends. You're not. This world is here for another reason. You can consider this experience as being a spiritual obstacle course deliberately put here and kept here to produce spiritual giants. And until you have reached that spiritual giant, giant, giant hood, then you just loop back until you get it right. You're not here to save the world. You're destined for somewhere greater. John 17, 14. In his prayer to the Father, Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not from this world. You can't get more clear than that. You're not here to save the world. You're not even of the world. Now, John 17, 16, the prayer continues. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Scripture thought to say that twice. John 14, 2 through 3. Jesus speaks of the heavenly abode. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Yeah. The exodus won't happen until the chief cornerstone is sitting on top of the monument of man, monument of man and the structure is geometrically perfect. That is how exodus occurs. So he, his promise is very real right here. I will come back for you, that you may go where I am. This is all implicit that you're not here to save the world. It is a construct. You're here as a pilgrim. You're here as a sojourner, a traveler going through a wicked, a wicked land, which is what the book of Revelation calls it, Egypt and Sodom. So, John 15, 19. Jesus tells his disciples, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. How many of you resonate with that? How many of you understand just the level of animosity and animus that is aimed at you by people who don't understand you? In your own communities, in your own families. Yeah, guys, this is what spirituality is about. Spirit, the spirit, the spiritual family, according to the Bible, the spiritual family is of the adoption because blood relations don't mean anything in the world of the spirit. And this is reiterated over and over and over. Even the 13th tribe of Israel, which was the only tribe known for assimilation, taking in all cultures and creeds among them, the tribe of Ephraim in Egypt. Egypt was cosmopolitan at that time. 
every race, every creed, every philosophy, every religion. The Egyptians didn't care. Hey, under Ephraim, they didn't give a damn. All, all they cared is you paid your taxes. And in the prophetic literature of the Old and New Testament, the 13th tribe, Ephraim, is the tribe of adoption. This is what is reiterated in the writings of Paul, that, that we are spiritual beings under the adoption. Yeah, because the blood ties don't mean anything. Even Jesus said families will turn against family. So this uh I just wanted to show those verses to show you guys, man. There is there is scriptural support for the idea that we're not here to save the world. I, and I get frustrated with Christians over and over and over trying to tell me that if enough minds come together, Jason, can, can't we affect the field to the point where we can create a golden age? I says, well, that's in total defiance of the construct programming. The construct programming is to hold golden age as a carrot over your head, but it's never happened. We have zero history of the world of where there was ever a utopia. We only have stories that were fictions introduced into the field to get people. You, if, if all the information from the ancient past was dark and dismal, then, then the construct wouldn't work. They've got to dangle that carrot. This is why we have a two-party system. The two-party system, politicians are always promising things they never deliver on. But as long as a new politician rises up from the other, other team and we can jump ship, as long as that illusion of choice is always out there, we will always follow the carrot. Believe me, I know about follow, following a carrot, guys. Yeah, I know I know about follow, following a carrot. It's called parole. They held, they held that parole carrot in front of me for so long, I quit giving a damn. And I started doing things my own way. And I ended up staying in prison a whole lot longer for it. But I didn't care by that time. So, anyway, yeah, this, this is how it works. This is what they're doing. All right, I don't want to lose my spot. So I want to I want to iterate one thing. We're not here to save the world. We're not here to save the world. But waking up is evidence that you are chosen. You were selected for your eyes to be opened. This isn't something that you did at all. The the, tie, the the description of redeemed means that a price was paid for you, whether you deserved it or not. That's what being redeemed is. When it comes to being redeemed, it means something was given up to something else in order to remove you from whatever situation you were, you, you were in. Uh, you, were, uh, you were redeemed. It does not mean that you deserved that at all. Chosen is the same thing. Being made the elect is also the same thing. It does not mean that there's anything that you earn. Because remember, if we were on the type of scale that artificial intelligence X wants us to believe, that we have to do a certain number of rights to undo a certain number of wrongs, if you really believe you're under that system, then you're, you're experiencing dungeon programming. Because right here we have in the Word, the logo said exactly, he said, go and sin no more. And that one thing was absolute. It was absolute. And the past wasn't a predicate for that individual's future who followed that dictate. All right. So, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in their case, this is the collective now, in their case, this is those who are of the world. This is in the passage. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light. This is dungeon programming. That's artificial intelligence X, the Demiurge right here, Araman, call him what you want, Angramenu. That's that's ultimately what it goes to. For those of you who don't know, Angra Menu is is the is the darkness aspect, the evil the evil aspect in the ancient Zendavesta, in which was which was written in Avestan. It is the uh, the teachings of Zoroaster. And for those of you who don't know, most of the Old Testament and almost all the eschatology from the Old and New Testament came straight out of the ancient Iranian prophecies. Most people don't know this. A lot of Christians don't want to hear it. Uh, uh, Jews definitely don't want to hear that almost 100% of their belief systems all came out of Iran. So, well, we'll get to, that's that's subject of another video. But yeah, that's uh, 
And shit, that, that verse is another verse, man. You're not here to save the world. You're not, you're not here to do any of that. It's not why you're here. You're here to pass through it. So modern Christianity is only fooling itself. A soul does not become virtuous. It just, you know, it doesn't become virtuous to become one of the elect. That's not what that's not how, how it works. He is virtuous because he is one of the elect. There's a distinction here. This dovetails nicely with the statement of James Allen. Some of you guys have read James Allen. You've quoted him in my comment sections before. When we receive not what we want, no, so, no, excuse me. We receive not what we want, but what we are. That's James Allen. I didn't make that up. James Allen said that, but it, dove, it dovetails very nicely with what we're talking about. Further, this implies that faith is not conceived and known at all. Faith is not conceived and known. It is lived and enacted. It's an action, guys. It's not passive at all. At all. So, let's go with... Uh, We, we have it wrong about God, about the eternal. We have it very wrong. It's all. Remember, I've told you in past presentations that I believe that, that my God is so mysterious that 10,000 different opinions about him can all be right. We can't, from inside the construct, we just can't put perimeters. We can't, we can't put identifiers on, on the eternal. It's far beyond our capacity to comprehend from inside such a restricted sphere. It's just not happening. But I believe that even, even our failures are acceptable to God. The parable of the prodigal son is evidence of this. That the wayward son was allowed to lose all his money, to disobey his father, to go to a far country, lose everything. It even says he was whoring around. He comes back hungry, clothes gone, destitute, he comes back, and instead of getting the hammer down on him, instead of dad putting them things on him, instead of getting whipped on a post, instead of being turned into an indentured servant in his by his own family, instead, the father opened up his arms, wept, gave him a, a new ring, brought called all friends and family and had a huge banquet to celebrate his return. The other son received nothing like that. The difference is, is the prodigal son went out and did things and experienced and learned and was subjected, subjected to the outside world, which was not protected by the father. And the prodigal son got to got to live and learn, and then came by way of the knowledge that the father knew best by actual experience, and was not punished for that. The prodigal son is an amazing story about our situation in the construct. So. Uh, this next, uh, next section here, as we get closer and closer to time travel. Thank you, Gabriella T. That's a, that's a new name to me. So, Randy Millwood, I have lived the dark side forever. Well, let me tell you something. You're going to have a dark side. It's called human nature. I have a dark side, and so does everybody listening to my voice, whether they want to admit it or not. And this, too, is known by the eternal, and it's taken into consideration. That's why a woman caught in the middle of adultery, brought before Jesus, Jesus didn't care. Go and sin no more. That's it. Now, oh, you know, that's a good point. Jonathan Sherman, that's a good point. Didn't the father give him a new robe? I need to go back and read the prodigal son. Because if he did, then it links that parable to the Christian mysteries. He that overcometh will I give him a white robe. Man, it's a good catch. Thank you, Jonathan. 
I will I will look back into that. The Philosopher's Stone, transmuting the unreal to the realized. Really interesting because I had put this little section together before I heard Dawn listening to the Unfuckers group, and they were openly talking about the Philosopher's Stone and alchemy and all that. And they're they're uh, uh, Danny was talking about her interpretation and all that. And I, I largely agree with it. wasn't talking about wasn't talking about the transmutation of, of actual minerals and metals and all that. It's, there's there are deeper meanings. How how just interesting synchronicity here that their group was talking about that the day before that I was doing this video, and yet I had already planned to do this video three days ago and posted it on YouTube. Very interesting synchronicity. So. <coughs> Philosopher Stone transmuting the unreal to the realized. So this holosphere is an impressionable medium, meaning it's not fixed. The perimeters that govern our daily lives are not fixed. It is an impressionable medium. It takes products of the imagination, which are fictions, and turns them into experienced facts. This is what this is what our environment does. You can't see it, but this is what it's doing. The generative field, this construct that, we, that we're in, the simulacrum, it is a generative field that interfaces with the informed field that is you. You're, remember, you're borrowing this from, from the construct. This avatar belongs to the construct. You're inside that avatar as an informed field. And that informed field has every experience and every memory from every life sim you've ever lived since you entered the construct. Every rotation, every life sim, every life, every birth, your informed field carries every bit of that. You may not, by virtue of the central nervous system through all its filters, remember all these experiences and all that, except when you are unhinged from that, from that mooring in the dream state. But when you're not asleep, you are jacked into the system, which is really the exact opposite of what the spirit experiences. When you're in your deepest sleep, your spirit is very active. When you are awake, your spirit is suppressed. And you need to learn how to bring it to the surface in your conscious waking daily life. So, the generative field is totally independent of existing conditions and can originate new conditions out of nothing. Remember, this video is about timelessness, time travel. You have the ability to bring things into your experience ex nihilo, out of nothing. David Icke, very controversial figure. I like him. But David Icke, he wrote that we are the direct result of the magnetic image we cast of the way we think our think of ourselves. That's a direct quote from one of his books. David Icke said, David Icke wrote that. We are, we are the direct result of a magnetic image we cast out of the way we think of ourselves. And I agree. Self-perception creates circumstances and conditions that confirms one's own self-image. Meaning, reality responds to you in the exact proportion to the way you perceive yourself. If this is true, then time itself does not obtain. I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. Our assumptions of truth become the truth. Our assumptions of truth become the truth. Because the field will always reflect back as circumstances those things that are projected into it. If you doubt that you are able to accomplish a certain thing, the construct will make sure that enough phenomena manifests in your life to justify the doubt that it knows you feel. It's not going to make you out to be a liar. An attitude will always influence outcomes every single time. Your attitude 
whether it be good or bad, will always influence the, the outcome of anything that is being experienced. Vegas knows this really well. It has already been proven that people who, are, who, for their first time in their life, their level of excitement is super high, and they walk onto a casino floor, they, they win more money than seasoned gamblers. Because expectation and excitement creates an, creates an empowering of the informed field to where the informed field of the excited soul actually affects the outcome of a random number generator. And this has been scientifically conclusively shown multiple times. This is why floor managers in casinos are trained to spot this activity and they're trained to cause that individual to break pattern because that instantly resets the field and then they lose their mojo. How do, they, how do they cause an individual who is just on a winning streak from excitement and has entered that winning feedback loop where everything they do, they just win and they get more excited and, and they try a different game and they win at that too? How does the floor boss stop it? Since a beautiful woman with a drink or a beautiful woman to slide up and talk to you. Even really, even really pedantic stuff as having a waiter drop a tray in their presence. Anything to break that break the pattern to reset that individual's field. Anything. They, they, they're trained to know so many techniques. I don't even know them all. But they're trained to know so many different t- techniques on how to cause that individual to break pattern. Because once they break pattern, when they're in, when they're in a, a feedback loop like that, they can't get back into it very easily. So, yeah, a lot of times they're compted. Somebody will come up and interrupt them with compted rooms. Hey, we would like you to stay here. And, you know, there's all kinds of theories. Oh, they just want you to stay in the hotel longer. No, a lot of these things are done to, to break pattern. All right. Uh, so. This is, this is divine alchemy, spiritual alchemy, the recognition that everything around you is malleable and all you need is the right ingredients to create the right phenomena that you want to experience. None of this is possible if time wasn't, wasn't breachable. None of this would be possible if, you were, if reality wasn't malleable. If, if the sequential ordering of manifested events were rigidly compartmentalized into segments that we call time, and we were unable to move forward and backwards spiritually, then we would never be able to create circumstances that we want to experience. But we've already done it. There are thousands of people that do it every single day. Most of the people who have very miserable lives have been doing it all their life. They've just been going in the wrong direction. It's the same power. They just applied it wrong. So time has to be completely breachable to the spirit, even if it's not to the cerebellum, to the the conscious individual. The spirit must be able to move forward and backward in time if the spirit is attached to source, like I believe it is. Why is this? Because anything attached to source, source, also benefits from the power of source. And if source is eternal, then by this contact, you are eternal as well. Eternal means you have no place in time. Time has no meaning for the spiritual individual. So it only has meaning inside the construct. This is spiritual alchemy. The ability to understand that whatever the phenomena is, it can be transmuted into something else. Check my chat before I go to the next section. Fear is the antipode of faith. That's the next section. Remember, you guys are going to be able to read all this. Fear is the antipode of faith. All right. So, we already know that people who live in fear synchronize their spirit to receive the frequencies of those very things that are feared. 
anybody who has a very fearful nature, they have allowed themselves to succumb to a feedback loop that is in resonance with everything that they're scared of. That's what fear is. Fear is the opposite of faith. If spirits were magnetic, then fear would be would be the total opposite of faith on the poles. Faith is not only the opposite of fear, but the spirit that experiences one is never able to experience the other at the same time in the construct. It's not possible. It's not possible. It is impossible for these two modes of frequency to even coexist in the same soul. It's not possible. One soul can be fearful and a bunch of other souls around it can be full of faith and experience no fear. But not one of those souls is able to feel both fear and faith at the same time. It's not possible. Yeah. So the positive mind produces power generated into a neutral field waiting for instruction. The generative field, the construct, it is always waiting for instruction. Most of the time, we're always instructing it to do the very things that we have addressed our focus on. Mainstream media, fear programming, dungeon programming, negative default programming, anything going on somewhere. Oh, my God, something's going on in the Texas border. Something's going on in Ukraine, Russia, uh, Israel. Oh, they're not telling the truth. Oh, what's going on in Gaza? Listen, as long as that's where our focus is, then we are borrowing that frequency. When our spirit aligns with the frequency of the very things that agitate and bother us and make us fear, then we enter that feedback loop and it gets really hard to break pattern from it. Mainstream media is toxic. It is specifically designed to reinforce dungeon programming. Positivity is freedom to create forms by thought and action. Slavery is fear-based thought that subjects you to the very dungeon programming that you're being critical of, or the dungeon programming that you're trying to escape, or the dungeon programming you recognize and don't want to experience. Try, right, guys. If you think there is opposition, opposition will always appear. Remember, the construct is reflective and generative. It will instantly absorb what you're thinking. It will, it will see the order of magnitude that it needs to reflect it as, which is based off your emotion attached to that thought. It will see what your avatar is doing in the physical world, and it will, it will respond accordingly. You are the spiritual alchemist walking through a medium of spiritual mercury that is responding to every move you make and every thought. And it takes those up as, a, as your thoughts have a mathematical equation, your movements have another mathematical equation that are attached to coordinates, and it combines that arithmetic between spirit and matter to basically prognosticate exactly what you expect to experience. And then it knits that reality tunnel for you just like that. This is what happens to us on a daily basis, guys, every single day. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. Uh, everybody is. So application of force is a broadcast of energy exhibiting a lack of faith. Process that for a minute. If you feel you have to try real hard to do something, then the construct is going to reciprocate. It's going to make sure that you're going to have to expend a tremendous amount of energy and effort to accomplish whatever it is you think you might not accomplish. It's a feedback loop. You're putting yourself in it, and the construct is only guilty of giving you what you expect. That's it. Now, the light firm touch. It's different. No matter how big the obstacle, no how, how, how prolific the problem, it doesn't matter. The light, firm touch from a spiritual individual tells not of weakness. Just because I'm not gripping this cup and holding it up real strong, just I barely lift it up by the handle and move it smooth, 
That's not indicative of weakness. That's indicative of great power held in reserve. Let the construct see you as an individual inside with inside that medium who believes that every slight movement they make in the direction they want will will be reciprocated with maximum maximum change and the construct will, will will respect that because that's the programming you need remember you are a co-creator and as long as you do your part which is understanding your role then you can you can bank on the fact that the oversoul will do the rest you're not here to build anything you're a spiritual architect you're a divine alchemist you build with the mind and then you move your avatar in that direction. And the builder protocols, which belong to the oversoul, are going to make that for you. They're going to make that happen. And any time that you think is going to have to pass in order for you to experience what you had only mentally seen is entirely dependent on you. If you think a lot of time is necessary for these changes to come about for you to experience, then the construct is going to make sure that obstacles are, are put in place to make it a long time before you experience the very things that you that you had seen or want to do experience. If you think it can be instant, then it can be because timelessness of the spirit attaches to you because you are moored to the eternal. This gives you your ability to be timeless. Remember, don't forget it. Go and sin no more was absolute. Did not matter about the past. None of that. It was The focus was totally on the present. And it had everything to do with the, with the future. So check my chat again before we go to the next section. A perceived reality. Hmm. wonder if I got some backup. All right, Let's see here. Chat's going nice. 2,000 in the chat, that's good. Oh, we haven't got to the juicy, juicy yet. We only got two small sections left a perceived reality, and then the final. The magnum opus of this presentation, borrowing from the future. Man, look at that. Now, that's a feedback loop. I love being in. Thank you. Man, coffee's so good. All right. Okay. A perceived reality. So one of my favorite authors I, I've told you guys about, I'd have to go through all these drawers to find this book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, Ishak Bentov. He also wrote another book called A Brief Tour of Higher Consciousness. If you think the world is a physical reality, then you need to read this man because he is a physicist and he has the unique ability of taking very vast and complex ideas and data and simplifying them for the everyday man. His two books were written for the layman. They were not written for the scientist. A Brief Tour of Higher Consciousness and Stalking the Wild Pendulum, Ishak Bentov. He wrote, the physical body is made up of interesting pulsating fields. What we call physical body, the flesh, bones, and blood, rapidly disappears when highly magnified. So I've already addressed this multiple times. I just wanted to reiter reiterate it here. For those of you who think the world is a product of, of something physical, you're in error because even our scientists understand that the more you magnetize what is perceived to be physical reality, the more we find open spaces between the things that we believe are the properties of physicality. And when we actually isolate a what we think is physical like an atom or something and we blow it up it only it, it, it dissolves into an oscillating field of light so if upon magnification it is it is very evident that there are vast distances between what we call nuclear you know uh, uh the nucleus of an atom protons electrons neutrons basons basons muons all the little subatomic particles 
if it is admitted by the scientists scientists that their model shows a quantum aspect to reality that there is more that is not there than is actually there then how difficult is it to process that all of this is just modes of spirit when even physical matter like this dissolves into an oscillating field of light upon mag magnification so while we are the nexus between the quantum and the cosmological, the infinitely tiny light components of the ether, the field, the construct, to the vast constructs in the field that have been built out of the worlds of ideas already impressed upon the holography by others. If we are, if we are the nexus between both, then we have to be something that is beyond both in order to in order to encompass it all and we are it's called immortals we are spirits and in this this world that we think is real is an experience it's not an actual reality it is an experienced reality it is a perceivable world not a real world the placebo effect is direct evidence that this is a perceived reality not an actual one if if scientists can take control groups separate them and have some of them some of them alter a random num number generator while others get truly random deals based off the input what the observers were told to see guys it's not a real reality it's a malleable one it's one that we can we can change if the placebo effect has thousands of test subjects being healed of maladies that they thought only pharmaceuticals could do this is a perceived reality because many of those people took salt pills. They didn't take any medicine, but they were told that they were being given the cure and they were healed. This is a perceived reality, not a real one. The placebo effect is evidence of that. I know some of you have done some research on the placebo effect. One of my, one of my favorite authors too, from over, from over 350 years ago is Rene Descartes. So, Rene Descartes, he understood that our reality was perceivable only, just like Plato. Remember the shadows. Of the, remember in Plato's in Plato's uh, uh, was it in the Republic? He has the shadows on the wall. They're talking to each other, but they hear the voices of the others, and they see them as shadow. And then one of the shadows breaks free and gets free and looks outside the cave and realizes the shadows were shadows, and now sees reality for what it is and understands he's he's awakened now. And realizes he was formerly just a shadow. So Rene Descartes, you know, he's a real deep critical thinker. He's the master of deductive reasoning. So he wrote, I have convinced myself that there is absolutely nothing in the world. No sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Does it now follow that I too do not exist? No. If I convinced myself of something, then I certainly existed. So Descartes, Descartes, his his method, he's just method. His, his method. I, I can't even say it right now. Too much coffee, guys. But uh, he was very methodical. Doubt led him to question the reality of the external world, suggesting that our perceptions and beliefs about the world would be deceptive. For somebody almost 400 years ago, thinking and writing and publishing these things, that's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. He agreed, based off a lifetime of research and observations and reading prior great minds, that the world was unreal. But did that make him unreal? He said, no, because I had the very ability to doubt and to doubt myself. And that's what made him real. He literally said, I'm a spirit and everything else is, is false. So, 
another, another great mind. I, I haven't quoted him much. I, I did quote him a few times in my earlier videos three years ago, but I really like uh, Massimo Citro. I have a lot. I have papers full of quotes that I wrote by hand. I just haven't really got them out to read to you guys on YouTube, but Massimo Citro is fantastic. Here's a theoretical physicist. He's far sharper than most of the people in his field. And uh, he said that we are victims of a machine that produces a virtual reality that keeps us separated from the real reality by representations that are not real. This is what Ma Massimo Citro said in, his, in one of his latest published books. It's phenomenal, but it sounds a lot like Arthur Schopenhauer, one of my favorite German philosophers. And uh, if it wasn't for Will Durant actually writing so many history books, Arthur Schopenhauer would be my favorite German philosopher. But uh, Will Durant still has that still has that has that that, that seat. So. It, I mean, Massimo Citro also sounds a lot like Rene Descartes in this regard. So Massimo also said that our bodies are illusions, that we live inside a fiction. This is a theoretical physicist who, who is publishing these things. He didn't just say them off to the side. He has very prestigious peer-reviewed published books where he is saying these things. It's amazing. Mm. So, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a perceived reality, guys. Reality isn't actual. It is a product of our perception. This isn't Jason telling you this. There are many more qualified researchers, authors, scientists that, that you could get this from. You, you don't have to get it from ball-headed ex-con. You don't. There's a lot of good material out there that covers this topic that that reality is just not real and that it is a perceived reality. So this is why I'm a simulationist as well. Simulation theory doesn't offend doesn't offend my, my senses. To me, it's to me it's more evidence of a, of a spiritual construct. Simulation theory is just a frame of reference because we don't have an accurate term in our in our grammar today that can actually describe how beautifully spiritual this experience is, how this construct is actually a extension of the eternal. If we had that description in the English language, I would be using it. But instead, I have to use what is commonly known as a frame of reference. And to me, I borrowed simulation theory. But I believe 100% this is all spiritual. So this is a perceived reality. So what does all this mean? Everything that I've itemized all, all the way through here, through this presentation, what does it really mean to the individual since we have identified that we are spiritual beings in a falsified realm? We experience that falsified realm through, through our perception of it. Our perceptions are modified by what we accept to be true. We are timeless beings over and over. This is expressed in many different ways. We know that the past is not a predicate for the future. Me, and we know that Jesus was very much telling us that the selfless act of an instant can undo a lifetime of guilt. Go and sin no more. So, Let's change direction just a little bit to put all this into, into, into a better clarity. Another author I, I like, but he comes from the business world. He used to be on the lecture circuit. I don't know if he is anymore. His name is Paul Arden. Paul Arden said, if you can't solve a problem, it's because you're playing by the rules. So we need to figure out Who's making up the rules? Because the rules were give, that were initially given to me had me believing that totally different. Had me believing that that Christianity was promoting was promoting all these ideas that that just didn't jibe with me. But when I realize that rules are implemented for those who are already ungovernable. That rules are created and implemented as control systems. 
when I apply the fact that I am spirit and therefore I am moored to something that is eternal and I realize rules aren't necessary, what are they necessary for? Remember, I do not act holy because I want to be a member of the elect. No, I am holy because I am a member of the elect. It's a totally diff different shift in perspective. I didn't do anything to earn being redeemed. I was redeemed because something on the outside saw me worthy. But in my finite ability to process the information of my experiences, I concluded that my past was so nefarious and evil and I've done all these things. And, and yet, how is it that I have been plucked from the fire? How is it that I have, I have been awakened? How is it that I have been gifted spiritual abilities that I know that I have received advantages for in life? How is it? I didn't earn that awakening. I was chosen. I'm not just talking about me, guys. I'm talking about you as well. There's no earning here. Remember, she was brought in the act of adultery, an adulteress, a, a woman who had probably done it multiple times in the past and been, been, been guilty of many other things in the past, and he did not care about any of the minutia or particulars. All he cared about was that she goes. Go means to do something. Go and sin no more. Nothing in the past obtained. Paul Arden, if you can't solve a problem, it's because you're playing by the rules. The rules I'm telling you that are out there are the physics dictates, are the common sense dictates that have been imposed upon us by our betters. What I'm telling you is that more to the eternal, the rules do not apply to you. They're not needed. You're not going to do anything that's going to violate the tenets of spirit because that's not your nature. Therefore, rules are, are not needed to govern the perimeters of your behavior. If you can't solve a problem, it's because you're playing by the rules. So let's look at it differently. The rules tell you you're living in the present. The rules tell you, th this is what the rules tell you. The rules tell you that the present is a direct correlate with all the events that led up to it in the past. This is what the rules tell you, but the spirit tells you otherwise. The rules tell you that the future is unknown, but we know it is, it's called prophecy. The rules tell you that the future is inaccessible, but that's not true. You're moored to the eternal. Therefore, there must be a method by which you can gain advantage from your future self just as you, your present self has gained advantage despite how dark your past self used to be. Go and sin no more is implicit that you have the creative ability to do incredible things. This is where we're leading to in this section. Remember, this is not an actual reality. It is a perceived reality. And this experience is merely a result of our perceptions. And if that's true, then borrowing from the future perception is not impossible at all. And nor would it be against any rules. Are you following my logic here? There is nothing restricting you from envisioning a future where you are more intelligent. You have mnemonic enhancement abilities that are, that are out of this world. A future where you are a divine being far in excess to anything you have imagined up until this point. A future where you have all the wealth you could ever want because it's almost meaningless to you. It's so easy to acquire. A future where you are partnered with the individual that you really want to be partnered with because it's so easy 
you attracted each other. A future where you have the ability to say anything you need to say with as few words as possible because you have acquired a wisdom over all this time period that you can tap into from a future version of yourself. You can, by virtue of imagination, you can look into the future, imagine the individual that you have become, and then be that individual in the present by application. If you're, if you can't solve a problem, it's because you're playing by the rules. It's time to defy all that. It's time to be eternal. It's time to transcend the present parameters of your existence by virtue of imagination, which is a spiritual, it's a spiritual uh, uh, trait. Imagination, intuition, and empathy. These three things are what identify you from the collective, and the collective, the collective are not able to do these things. They are not moored to source like you are. So Albert Camus, a lot of people don't like him, but I find value in all authors. I'm gonna find something of value. Even even Billy Carson, I'm a critic, but I'm gonna find something of value. And Albert, Albert Camus, he wrote that the last pages of a book are already contained in the first pages. This is a deep philosophical statement. It's a deep philosophical statement. So if, you, if your existence was a vast book and you're on page 53 right now, you already know what happened pages 1 through 52. But you can also envision, you can use a spiritual ability, imagination, to put who you are together on page 79 in the future. And by virtue of imagination, you can study that individual. And then you can agree in the present that you are the same individual as that and bring back that wisdom, that intuition, that strength that clarity, that vocabulary, that memory, you can bring it all back to the present and you can utilize it. And it may be difficult for you at first, but once you realize that it's possible, you enter that feedback loop. And then the construct begins making you into the person that you envisioned that you were in the future. And you pull that right back into the present. And then the construct recognizes that you're doing this more easy, easily, so it brings more strength, more acuity, more understanding, more wisdom, more spiritual power, because now you are tapped into source, and source is timeless. James Ray said it best. When you look at your current state of affairs and define yourself by that, then you doom yourself to have nothing more than the same in the future. Well, if that's true, then the exact opposite is equally true. James Ray said, when you look at yourself by your current state of affairs and define yourself by that, then you doom yourself. Let's turn that around. When you look at your future state of affairs and you define yourself by that, then you bless yourself to have the same in the present. All you have to do is look at the obverse of anything that is factually true today. And you can turn it all the way around. This is spiritual alchemy. I'm going to drink to that. Face diaper. That's a good, that's a good canvas quote. He's got so much, so many books. I've only read two of them. Now, because the spirit is moored to that which is eternal then our present self is little different from the self that we will one day be. The difference is, is you haven't recognized it. And since our future self is able to, well, since our future self is also our present self, and this self actually lies outside of time, then there is no mystery in our present ability to draw power, courage, healing, faith, from a future version of our timeless identity. That's all I'm saying here. It's very simple, just, just like all spiritual truths are. It's very, very simple. You have to remove all the complexity to see it clearly. 
So imagination is where most of us live anyway. What I'm describing to you isn't anything that you aren't already doing anyway. Let me explain. Imagination is where most of us live on a daily basis. You can argue tooth and nail about that. But the truth is, on a daily basis, while you're awake, you are living more in imagination than you're living anywhere else. Let me give you an example. All day long, your mind is pulled by external stimuli and by emotional things and interacting with other people's fields. All day long, imagery comes up in your mind of things that you experienced of a similar nature in the past. You see things, you hear things, you smell things, you taste things that remind you of experiences in the past. All day long, you're coming into contact with other personalities, watching presentations, rubbing up against them in an elevator, and your fields interact, and thoughts coming into your mind are you remembering when you experienced or felt something similar in the past. That is imagination. Memory is imagination. You are remembering what you felt, where you were. You're remembering all these things. It happens to you all day long. You're living in memory. You're living in imagination. But you're also phasing out. You're going from the past to the future instantly. You phase out. You do this every day. I do it every day. You phase out without even touching the present. You go from memory to worry, anticipation, fear about future things you have no control over. And you do it in an instant without ever passing through the filters of the present. This is all done by virtue of imagination. Every bit of it. So when thinking of the future, most people slip into negative default mode because the thinking is negative. We've been doing it all our lives, and it's the cause for all of our present conditions. It's because we're not governing over this. We're not recognizing it when it happens. So by thinking about all these things in the past, by worrying about things in the future, remember what the construct does. It's very, very sensitive. The construct takes all this memory from the past, all these memories from the past and the emotions that are attached to them and all these worries and anxieties and, and, and thoughts about the future. That's tomorrow's reality tunnel. It's totally knit for you. You're going to pass right through it. You did that 100%. You live by virtue of imagination you live in the past and you live in the future more than you live in the present every single day, every single day. So what I'm telling you shouldn't even, shouldn't even be mysterious. All I'm asking you to do is be aware that because on the outside of the construct, you are moored to a continuum that does not recognize distinctions between past, present, and future. And because your spiritual energy flows from a source that is timeless and eternal, then that means you have the ability to borrow from your future versions what you do not possess today. You can. I'm telling you because I do it. That's how this, this eighth grade educated you know, country boy in Central East Texas is, has the ability to do everything that I do, to remember, to recall, to, to get to the bottom, to take vast amounts of material and reduce them to their lowest common denominators and then present them. I have no history whatsoever of of giving speeches. I don't have any history. I've been in prison all my life. You can borrow from versions of yourself that are entirely self-created in your imagination. And two things happen because there's an exchange of information between your future self and who you are now. One of them is you're borrowing actual energy and actual phenomena from a future version of yourself. At the same time, as the construct is building that future version of yourself. It's timeless. It's happening at the exact same time. Thomas Troward, over a century ago, said, if the end is already secured, then all the steps leading up to it are secure as well. Thomas, Thomas Troward was a judge in 1902. 
That's why I, I, I remember this quote so well. But in 1902, he published a book, and uh, he, he said that if the end is secure, then all steps leading up to it is, is, is secure as well. That is also an admission of timelessness. There's, there's, there's nothing in this statement that, that leads you to believe that each step has to be accomplished and done and there has to be work for each one. No. If you have a concept about the future that you want to experience, according to Thomas Troward, if the end is secure, if in the present you already see the end, if the end is secure, then every single step leading up to the end is secure as well. If that's the way you live your life, you will be unstoppable in everything that you do. This man said this 120 years ago. So this is how we draw from ourselves more than we contain. I only have a limited amount of energy. I'm only able to express a limited amount of energy but I'm able to draw way more, way more than I possess. I'm able to draw it from somewhere else. And that somewhere else is source. And that source is timeless. It's timeless. 100%. So you got to learn how to draw from yourselves more than you contain. And this is only possible because we are moored to something else. And this power reserve is limitless. It's limitless. There's an old occult maxim that applies here. I didn't even have I didn't even have it on, on, on my sheet here, but there's an old occult maxim. The all is present in its parts. It's talking about God. You're a part, but the all is present in its parts. So the world of thought and imagination it vibrates on a higher order than base matter. And this is why the mental realm is not bound to the laws ascribed to the physical world. I'm going to repeat that. This is why the mental realm is not bound to the laws ascribed to the physical world. The world of thought and imagination vibrates on a higher order than base matter. Paul Arden, Paul Arden, guys, remember back to the beginning, the beginning of the section. Remember. If you can't solve a problem, it's because you're playing by the rules. Now, what did this say right here? It said, the world of thought and imagination vibrates on a higher order than base matter. This is why the mental realm is not bound to the laws ascribed to the physical world. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is perfect evidence right here. We are more than we suppose ourselves to be. And that's because if you think you're a lone soul, a lone personality, alone in the world, then you have literally created the feedback loop and the construct has insulated that loneliness to make you feel severed from source. And you won't find evidence in your life that there's a connection there because you close that connection. But in the fraction of a second, every, every bit of that can be undone. We, I started this presentation with, with a, a statement Jesus made. There's a lot more to that statement than meets the eye. Go and sin no more. You guys have been thinking that I have been reiterating that statement because sin has anything to do with what I'm talking about, and it doesn't. Go and sin no more is a statement that is absolutely final Meaning, you, the, the individual Jesus was talking to in each sect, each time in the New Testament he said that, he was recognizing that that individual had the power to absolutely change the trajectory of their life from a single decision. Jesus recognized that each individual had that power. Go and sin no more. He didn't tell you to go join a church didn't tell you to go join a synagogue. He didn't tell you to go find a guru. He didn't tell you any of that. He's, he knew that the power lied in the individual. And this is reiterated. 
Everybody wants to talk about everybody. Jesus healed everybody. I, I I went to church, Southern Baptist. I got sick and tired of hearing how how Jesus healed this person. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus cured the blind. Jesus, and over and over it says very clearly, Jesus admitted he never healed anybody, anyone. Over and over and over, people praised him for his healing powers, and all he ever said is, "By your faith, you were healed." By your faith, you were healed. That was his statement every single time. By your faith, you were healed. That's it, every time. So, the mind, the mind exists in a dimension beyond the material. This is what you need to understand to apply the principles in this presentation. You need to understand the mind exists in a dimension beyond the material. This is why it is so easy to comprehend how to play beyond the rules. The rules belong to the construct. Because thought is the start of all things, the past is totally inconsequential. Right now, as soon as this video is over and you get download this PDF and you read this PDF and you process this and you find you a quiet spot, I assure you, all you have to do is find that quiet, quiet, quiet spot in your life. You just need about 30 minutes to just reprogram. That's it. A single thought makes the entire past inconsequential. Go and sin no more. The field receives your new thoughts, and it is no way limited by precedent. The past is not a predicate for the future for the highly individualized soul that can borrow from the future, its future selves, just like it can borrow from its past selves if that soul has found that it's, it's in a darker position today than it was yesterday. Because time does not obtain. The rules do not apply to the spirit. The spirit is tapped to source. Source is on the outside of the construct. The past is not a predicate for the individual. The past is a predicate for the future, for the collective. But if you are elect, chosen, awakened, which has nothing to do with anything you did, then you're not a part of that. You're not a part of the body politic of the collective. You're not subject to the dungeon programming. It's why you are awakened. But that's in between you and source. That has nothing to do with Jason of Archaics or, or telling you your place in, in reality. I have no idea. All I know is that we are all connected to source. And if you are awakened, it's, it's nothing you did at all. Go and sin no more means that the power lies in the individual to be timeless. And, and when that individual recognizes that they are timeless, then it doesn't matter when in the past or in the future they acquired the things that they wanted. The powers, even the material objects, the amenities, it doesn't matter when because everything can be drawn into this is a perceivable reality. And if you want to perceive and experience the things that you want, then just go get them from the future. That's my presentation. I'm done. Done with that. Like I said, as soon as I as soon as I close this, as soon as I close this presentation out, guys, I'm gonna uh Jay Hart. Bless your heart, Jay Hart. I know Jay Hart, she's a long-term supporter. Long term, three years supporting uh, archaics. Uh Jay Hart, she's asking about this is this is Molnar, Thor's hammer blessed the meek and it punished the wicked this is this is a uh, thor's hammer it has a name molnir i used to wear one in prison all the time but it was a cheap version this one's real nice this one is super nice see if i can i can show that to you I feel bad i hadn't shaved
Yeah, guys, the, the Bible is fantastic. I told you many times in my presentations that I'm not taking anything away with it. But you have to recognize it is a book of good and evil. And that, and, and that's, that's the way it should be. It's the way it should be, guys. You have The spiritual being has to go through and figure out. Can't just be given to you. You got to figure it out. And you got to realize there are many, many layers of teaching. That's what makes it so supernatural. There are many, many layers of teaching. Just like go and sin no more. You would think the focus is on sin. You would think the focus is, oh, okay, well, uh, as long as you don't sin no more, Jesus is going to love you. Jesus is going to save you. That's not even the focus. It's not even the focus. Go and sin no more. The focus is the absolute, the absolute power of the individual to totally divorce themselves from an entire historical trajectory they've been on all their life. Jesus recognized you got the power to change. You just move just, just like that. It's crazy. It's crazy, guys. So many of them. So many of them. Let's see here. Oh, Jedi Master. There you go with that BS, Darius. I might have to do a Star Wars breakdown soon. <clears throat> I mean, these are the type of things that I mean, these are the type of things that we also talk about at meetups because the meetups get real deep. The meetups get real deep. The, uh, the roundtable meetups. Thank you, India. Appreciate it. Oh, the meetups get super deep because we're, 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 it's more informal than YouTube. It's, it's very, uh, it's very personal. And some people, I mean, we, we've had meetups where, you know, they get really emotional. You know, we've had people crying in meetups before. It's just, uh, this is just the way it is. I go to I go to my meetups with an absolutely blank slate. I have no idea what to expect. I have no idea what kind of presentation I'm going to give or anything. So it's all uh, yeah. It's it's the meetups are awesome, guys. That's why I encourage you to come. And it's not like Graham Hancock, where you're going to pay eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars a ticket to go to go there and listen to you tell a bunch of pseudo history. Oh man, we charge as cheap as possible to cover the venue, cover our expenses and stuff like that. I think, I think, I don't know, Don knows. I haven't checked it. I think the meetup is like 50 bucks. 50 bucks a ticket to come hang out with us for nine hours. And and a bunch of people leave for free stuff. So yeah. I love the meetups because I get to meet people and we get to talk about these the same things we talk about on YouTube. We get to talk in a circle. It, it, but it's different. Instead of comments, people actually we take the time to listen to what everybody has to say in the circle and go around it. It's pretty cool. It's a cool environment, guys. <laughs> Some of y'all are crazy. San Diego's every year. We're going back to San Diego every single year, but it's going to be in the fall. But we're going to Florida. Definitely going to we're definitely going to Florida and Virginia uh, this year. Florida, Virginia, and then. And then, uh, I know you did, Darius. I was just teasing, but uh, we're definitely going to to Florida meetup, Virginia meetup. We're probably going to do another one in New Mexico because it's on the way to San Diego. It's a really good environment. We have friends in the New Mexico area, uh, so we're probably always going to do that meetup in New Mexico too. That's where I met uh, in the New Mexico meetup. We did one at a restaurant. Man, we packed that restaurant. A lot of people showed up. Uh, that's how I met Danny Katz. Danny Katz just interviewed me and, and uh, recently, and that interview's on Archaics TV. It can't be put on YouTube, but it's on Archaics TV. Yeah, it's crazy. It's all crazy. Christine Grace, we're trying to figure out where in Florida. We're having problems because Florida, I mean, it can't be too expensive. The, if the venue costs $5,000, it's almost like, oh, you know, it's not even worth it. But uh, yeah, some of these places in, in Florida are real expensive. To, to, to get a venue that's going to hold 300 people, 350 people. Let's see. We're looking for venues right now. Martin's going to be there with us. All right. Well, I don't want to ramble, and we don't have enough time for Q&A. So I'm going to close this video, guys. It's been great. I want to remember, 
The Patriot Pacification PDF is available for everybody. It's free. It's on Podia. You can go to the Archaic's com community post. The very last community post, it has the link download. If some of my moderators can provide that link download, that'd be cool too. Uh, it's also uh, uh, it's also in the description box for the video itself. I just added it right before we started this video. Also, give me about give me about six minutes after this video goes off, and I promise you, you'll have the PDF for this video. It's already been prepared, and an image. It's, all I got to do is put it on podium. That's it. But I hope you guys needed our little our little break. This was just a pattern break to tap back into spirit because we got some real serious videos coming up that are just amazing. Because uh, that's how it is. I, I wait. I sit on things. And I acquire more information, and I, I sit on things to the point to where it be, it becomes almost I almost feel compelled to go ahead and release them, like I did this one. And it's because I sit back and I wait. I just wait for these this this little spiritual nudge, and that's what happened. So this weekend, get ready for the Crimmies, Chris and Steve Crimmy. We're gonna have a blast. It's gonna be light. We're just gonna talk about all these ancient places. They sent me some pictures. Uh, plus, I have my own my own gallery of photos. Ancient Turkey is going to blow your mind. There's no other country in the world that has this type of archaeology. It is amazing. So that's what we're going to talk about, guys. That's this weekend. Hello, Rhonda. Haven't seen you in a couple weeks. One Tox. You, you guys are everywhere. Rayad Ali, moderators, I appreciate you guys. And uh, I'm going to sign out with this awesome outro. Love you guys.